Hi everyone, this is Scott McLeod. Welcome to another episode of the Coronavirus Chronicles. I'm very lucky to have with me today two awesome educators from the Milwaukee Jewish Day School. Uh, Aaron Lippman, who's the head of school, and Jory Brody, who's the dean of students. Uh, Aaron and Jory, let's just dive right in. Why don't you talk to us about how MJDS has been responding to the pandemic? How are you taking care of students, families, and staff? What does learning and teaching look like? What do you got for us? Um, all right, I'll jump in and then I'll turn it over to Jory. We started remote learning on March 16th. Uh, so we had about three weeks before our spring break and we're jumping back into it on Monday. And I'd say that our faculty and staff have been truly phenomenal in their approach. Uh, it probably took about a week to work out some of the initial kinks. What's gonna be asynchronous, what's gonna be live, what's going to be small group, individual or whole group. That really depended on the age of the student, the content area, um, and just the capacity of the teacher considering their knowledge of technology and their how quick they were to adjust. Sure. Um, but I think that, you know, our core values are wonder, empathy, and the Jewish value of tikkun olam we're repairing the world. And I think that our teachers have really maintained that throughout this distance learning where our kids are really feeling connected, loved, and, and supported. Jory, what would you say? Yeah, I mean, I think I would absolutely, and I would add to that, it's not, for us, it's not just about the academic learning, and we're really still looking at the whole child, which is something that we're doing in school and now out of school, and we've really been communicating a lot with parents about how they're feeling and how their children are doing and making sure that we're meeting their needs um, socially and emotionally as well. Right. So, you know, I think every school is trying to figure out what's the right balance between sort of relationships and emotional support and also trying to keep some academic learning happening. As an independent school, what does that balance look like for you all? So, you know, from our kindergarten through our eighth grade, we have I can statements, which are, you know, a distilled student friendly version of Common Core or Next Gen Science Standards. Okay. And that's what our teachers are aligning to. And we're thinking about assessment first, and then how does assessment connect to learning tasks, learning targets, what kids are going to do each day. Mm -hmm. Within that, though, we're also recognizing that it's okay to do a little bit less. Each family in their home is handling things differently. Mm -hmm. They have different capacity. And so for us, what our constant message is to our staff and our kids and their parents is, it's okay to do a little bit less, give yourself a break. Um, and it's amazing what sort of uh, innovations are coming out of this um, and students who are really passionate about something that we never realized beforehand. Uh, Jory, what else would you say? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's the bulk of what it is. Um, I think what we're finding is we're learning something new every day and that it's okay. And that it's we, just like we tell our students that we're looking for growth over time and it's not always just about the end product. It, it's growth over time for us and we are trying new things and daily I get emails from teachers, hey, or a phone call, hey, I found this, I'm going to try it with my students. And the answer is always yes, please try something new. Um, you know, take risks, which is another thing that we're asking our kids to do, we're asking our staff to do too. When we are really a student owned uh, learning approach. And so I think that fortunately works decently well, where you know, I have a fifth grader, a third grader and a kindergartner at home who go to MJDS. And they're fairly self-directed. Their teachers are interacting with them regularly. They know what to do, why, and how to do it. And teachers are readily available on Google Chat, Zoom, uh, Hangouts, what have you, to connect. But the kids are really able to motivate themselves. That's not always the case, but it is a connection to what we do when we are in the building. So I think that's an important statement, Aaron. I mean, what you're saying here is that your investments in student agency and uh, self-direction of the learning process are really paying off for you now as they're now distributed across their multiple homes, right? Um, and away from sort of the physical school setting um, and that you're reaping the benefits of students being sort of these self-directed learners um, in these new modalities. Um, it sounded like you also said that you're seeing some new interesting student learning happening. I wonder if you could share a little bit of, maybe a couple examples of that. Joy, you wanna go first this time? Yeah, I think, um well, it's interesting, the kids, when we talk about student-owned learning, you can show your teacher that you've learned something in 10 different ways. Right. Um, and we're watching kids, I have a fourth grader and a junior kindergartner who are both at the school, and I'm watching them 
show things like the teacher talking about patterns. Well, how do you show a pattern? You can do it in you know 15 different ways around your house. Um, and I think the fact that we talk a lot about um, exploration of learning and what does it look like for each individual child, really this was lending itself to it. Um, and we're also giving our kids the chance to talk to each other. So my fourth grader is peer editing with a friend and they're using Zoom. And it's amazing actually to watch how quickly our kids are adapting to technology. Right. Yeah. And I would add, so um, I know that, you know, so we offer, we're a dual language and a dual curriculum school. So we offer Jewish studies in Hebrew along with general studies. Um, and I've seen third graders working with their younger siblings, for example, at home to articulate 15 vocabulary words uh, around their house and make a video of that and send that in uh, to their teacher and then reflect on it. If we were in school, that would be a really hard thing to do. But on their own, kids are doing something like that. Or our eighth graders who decided on their own that they wanted to create a video to connect to Passover, a recent Jewish holiday that just completed. Uh, and again, if we had asked them to do that in school, they probably would have. But doing it on their own and showing their excitement and their curiosity for learning is something that we were really surprised about in a good way. Yeah. Fascinating, right? So we create these cool structures to facilitate student learning. And in some ways, some of those structures may actually be inhibiting some robust student learning, right? Because we haven't created enough space for the student to own it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, fascinating. Um, so tell us a little bit about, uh, as you think about your leadership team, what have you all done so far that seems to be working really well? Uh, so we have a leadership team that consists of, or single district school, so it consists of seven of us, which is me and Jory that are really focused on academics and culture, and then marketing, fundraising, business administration, etc. We meet weekly for about two hours via Zoom, which is something that we were doing in person, so it's a continuation. Mm -hmm. We have to pivot a little bit on what the topics are, what the focus is, and then we have an educational leadership team, which includes Jory and I and some of our teacher leaders. Mm -hmm. We meet regularly. Uh, we have a student support team that meets weekly, um, and then our upper and lower school and early childhood teams are meeting regularly as well. So with those different you know, pockets of leadership, we're really able to know what's happening with our families, what struggles are there, what opportunities are there, and, and some of the next steps. I mean, there's hiccups along the way, don't get me wrong. Sure. At Zoom, we love it, but you know, I'd rather be in person, but it's pretty right. good. Right. I think also I would add that there's um, the constant communication and the ability to know that, hey, I'm struggling with this and I'm going to pick up the phone and call someone else on our team and bounce an idea off each other and people have the right to Got it. So uh, what are you hearing from families? So what seems to be working well for them? Um, Karen, you want me to start? Sure. So I think we've been in, com in communication con consistently with families since March 13th when we left school. Um, what's working well, I think, is definitely their ability to connect with their teachers, the knowing that their teachers are available to talk with them, to work with them whenever. Um, and teachers have been, that's been the biggest compliment is that I've heard from parents. Um, and also um, the scheduling, the way that we are sending out information. And it's different across the grade levels. Um, our younger students through second grade get a weekly schedule uh, where it change, they can update throughout the week, but they get something for the week. Um, and then our third through eighth graders are getting a daily um, email sent to them with information. Our fifth through eighth graders have used a lot of Google Classroom, our fourth graders as well. Um, and I think just the consistency that we've sort of tried to keep things as, you know, there were hiccups along the way, of course, but the fact that we've tried to keep as much consistency in how we're delivering information has been helpful for families. Got it. Yeah, and we have a one, we've created, it's not perfect, but we have a, a kind of a one-stop shop. So through our website, a space where families can come and see what live learning, uh, you know, schedule is. So there's a link for each day, for each content area, for each grade, if there is live learning, and that mirrors the emails that families are getting per grade level. And I, again, I put it back on our faculty and staff. I think they've just done an amazing job of pivoting, being flexible, 
and really meeting our students where they're at. So, you know, I'm curious, there's the old saying that goes something along the lines of parents are their children's first and best teacher, right? At the same time, we also recognize that parents aren't, you know, formally trained educators. How are you sort of helping parents who might be struggling with the teaching role at home? Uh, so I think it's really individualized. You know, there are some families who need a lot of support and whether it's our school social worker or Jory or myself or a faculty member who's gonna reach out and kind of walk them through what might be best practices at home and then really listening to what those families are saying they need. Mm -hmm. And so it might be that, okay, focus less on this content area. It's okay if you skip this Zoom session. Right. It's okay to not turn in this work, but just be in regular communication so that we can help you. Um, and I know that Jory, probably you're getting the same, right? Yeah, I mean, I think the one thing that I have found that parents are asking for the most is they're asking for structure. How should they structure their day? And it's not a one size fits all. So a lot of times what I will do is sit down with a parent and say, okay, we'll talk on the phone and said, tell me a little bit about what, what's going on in your house. What does your day look like? And then from that, I help them to create it. Okay, here's what you could do to kind of go through your day with your child. And then I go back with them and check in. So I had a parent before spring break that I texted to them about noon and said, all right, we're halfway through the day. How, what worked? What didn't work? And, you know, reflecting on that. Sure. Just like you do with the kids at school. Right. Got it. Cool. So I uh, just think about where we are now and kind of looking forward. Where do you think the challenges are? I think the biggest challenge will be that we just, uh, as a state, heard yesterday that we're closed for the rest of the year. Yep. Um, and although a lot of our families and staff knew that was a likelihood, now it's official, so it feels a lot more real. And knowing that we did just distance learning for 16 school days, and now we're going to be doing it for about seven and a half more weeks. Mm -hmm. And so what is going to allow our staff to be sustainable um, in the high level of support they're providing? What additional innovations are we going to need to make? Whether there are tweaks here or there or, or more concrete changes, I, we're not sure yet, you know? So we're constantly modeling and thinking about what might work and really taking cues from our families and our teachers. Cool. And I think there's one, the one other piece that's going to be really important, it's going to be the biggest hiccup and is how to get the kids to still stay connected socially. Right. Um, that's so important at such a young age to make sure that they communicate with their peers. I mean, some of them have siblings at home, they don't all. Um, and let's be honest, you don't always want to communicate with your siblings. So just making <laughs> sure that we're maintaining, um, one of the things that MJDS really prides itself on is our sense of community yep. and making sure that we maintain that for our families. Yeah, you know, I teach graduate students, teachers who want to be principals, principals who want to be superintendents, that sense of community and the need for relationships is just as strong at that level as well. You know, we took a couple of weeks off and the first time we all got back together virtually, you know, it was very emotional. Um, I appreciate the emphasis on relationships. Um, anything else y'all want to share here at the end of our time? Um, I would say, share a couple of things. You know, we've really benefited from having a strong network of schools locally and nationally that we can bounce ideas off of. Like any good teacher, steal ideas yeah. and make them our own. And so little things, we do a virtual happy hour every week with our staff. Right. We do a virtual staff meeting every week where it's really just a chance to see each other and connect and make fun of one another. Right. Um, we really are working with our teachers to say, how can you create, um, you know, learning opportunities where students are required to work in small groups so that if they feel isolated, they're forced to connect with one another because the teacher's telling them, not the parent, and that feels different. Right. So little things like that. Yeah, smart. I, I, the one thing I would add is, you know, we obviously the main focus is on our kids and how do we keep our kids connected, but the staff is so important as well. And um, Aaron, we, when we were at school, we had a morning huddle. It was for five minutes every morning before the day started. And now Aaron sends out a huddle email every morning. And I think that's one really nice thing that we're doing to make sure that we start our day together in some way. Yeah, awesome. maintain normalcy as best as possible. Yeah, I know, right? So, <laughs> cool. Um, Aaron and Jory, thanks so much for sharing uh, what's happening there in Milwaukee. I'm very appreciative of your uh, willingness to spend some time with me and uh, good luck with the next couple months, right? God, thank you so much. We really appreciate the chance to connect. Yeah, absolutely. Be well, be safe. Thanks.